A warm welcome to another edition of the Magpie Circle and uh, more or less bang up to date uh, with uh, a former player today who can hopefully give us a bit of an insight into uh, Lewis Knight and what he can bring to Notts County. Um, delighted to be joined today uh, by Regan Booty. Very warm welcome, Regan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on here. I'm looking forward to speaking to you. Yeah, no, it's great, great, great to have you on. And for all our younger fans, I mean, we we go right back to sort of the sixties and the seventies, where only people of my age can remember and playing. So, pretty much everyone that listens and watches us today will be able to um, recollect your season with us. Uh, look a little bit ahead to what um, people like Lewis and I might bring. Um, but let's sort of talk a little bit about your time, your your and, and overall your career. Um, so. You're very much a product of the new footballing system. You, you spent many years at Huddersfield. So talk us through what it's like being um, spotted at an early age, kind of the challenges or the, the enjoyment you go through being in a youth system for a long period of time. So how, how did things all pan out for you at Huddersfield? Um, obviously, I, so like I said to you before we spoke, I was at Leicester before I went to Huddersfield and but that was kind of like pre-academy because academies don't really start until the age of eight as such so I moved to Huddersfield with family just before like academy started so when I left Leicester they said to me look go on trial at the nearest club when you move up north and obviously see what happens from there so I was at Huddersfield from the age of eight till 21 and obviously we was part of a very like successful under 18 team under 21's team that we won a couple of league got to the quarterfinal of the youth cup so it was at the time it was really good to be a part of and then progressing to the first team group of the year they got promoted to the Premier League which looking back was a good thing and a bad thing at the same time but it's all obviously part of the experiences growing up that it's good to be a part of winning teams and we had that a lot of Huddersfield to be fair. The, the modern game now is such that so from an incredibly early age you are involved with the pro club so even before the age of eight you you, you were kind of involved I, I, I was at Leicester City for many years so you would have been involved going what what one afternoon evening a week school holidays that sort of thing it was like two nights a week from the age of like seven and gradually working the way up till about 14 15 it'd be two nights a week and a day out of school um when I was in secondary school obviously playing on so it'd be like a Monday night Tuesday night, Thursday all day out of school, play on Saturdays or Sundays. And if we didn't plan a Sunday, we'd train on the Saturday and we could be travelling to the likes of Newcastle on a Sunday morning, which would take like three hours for like 12 o'clock kickoff. So it was it was a big commitment at the time. It was obviously, as a youngster, you don't probably realise how much your parents do for you growing up with that, all the travelling and stuff like that. So I can only thank them for that, really. That's a massive commitment at such an early age, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Obviously, when you're young, all you want to do is play football. So you don't really realise at the time, but obviously looking back now, your parents have a lot of responsibilities for you because there's obviously only so much you can do at a young age. But you rely on your parents to take you training three times a week to games on a Saturday, games on a Sunday, and it's just all part of it, I suppose. Um, so you're at Huddersfield, and, and I think you, you mentioned earlier, that there was, that it was good and bad when you kind of got elevated into the first team squad. Now, Huddersfield had the new stadium, uh, clearly a club on an upward path, getting into the top flight. Um, so how much do you kind of feel part of that as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old? Yeah, obviously, I've seen a lot of the whole change at the training ground. Uh, it completely changed from being like the public were allowed to be now to be in their own set training ground, all the pitches done, all the buildings and the changing rooms done. They obviously spent a lot of money from going up on the training ground, which I think they needed to. And obviously now it's a really good facility and stuff. So, but yeah, like, like I said, the whole growing up, like you in a, especially the year they went up, it was great to be a part of because you see what it's like to have a promotion and to be part of it was great. But like I said, it's comes with its flaws at the same time. Okay, so, so what were those flaws or challenges for you? So obviously the year they got promoted, I moved permanently with the first team in the January. So for the last six months, I was in the changing room with them all the time. I've been training with them before and for probably like six months a year, but to be fully promoted to the first team and stuff. Then between then and the end of the season, I was on the bench twice, I think once against Man City in the FA Cup, which was quite surreal. 
because their bench was like Sane, Sterling, De Bruyne. <laughs> it was quite a surreal experience. And then second to last game of the season, I was on the bench away at Birmingham, sell out. They had to win to stay up. So that was a huge game for them because we were already secured in the playoffs. But then obviously the promotion happened, which at the time was great. But going back to the free season the next year, I was back with the under 23s out of the first team changing room, like, and I wasn't told by the manager. It, like, the kit man came and told me first day of pre season, was like, you're back with the 23s. And it was like a progression that I was obviously felt like I was doing well to kind of a big back step that I was like, which kind of was a hard thing to take at the time. Um, there's a lot of debate in the modern game now uh, in terms of, so you would predominantly have been playing. Uh, while at Huddersfield in age group team, wouldn't you? And certainly in terms of competitive matches. Yeah. Um, so and a lot of people say it is a difficult transition from age group to uh, inverted commas full men's. So I'm, I'm guessing effectively your first real regular taste of open age football, for want of a better phrase, would have been going to older shots. So, so how, did, how did all that pan out? Yeah, so basically leading up to that, like the three windows before that, I was trying to get out on loan, but the club stopped me going because they wanted me to be in and around the group. Obviously, at the time, like, I, like, obviously I still wanted to get out, but at the time I was thinking, oh, I'm wanted here, stuff like that. But looking back, I think it was a, that was probably a thing that killed me in hindsight, that I should have gone on loan earlier. Like the, the summer before I went to Older Shot, I was down at Yeovil for three weeks in pre-season all ready to sign on loan there for the season and it was the night before the first game and it was all getting sorted and Huddersfield tried putting a clause in there that if I didn't play like a certain amount of games that Yoga would get fined and at the time Yoga were like we can't afford to do that but we guarantee you'll be playing games and I tried stopping Huddersfield getting that put in and they wouldn't so that was I was 19 at that point obviously looking to get on loan to League 2 for a season then I had to go back and play 21's football for another year so that was like my third or fourth year at 21s. So it was like, I needed to get out and play, but they stopped me going, which probably hindered me at the time. You eventually, so you eventually get the break at, because because yoga would have been a league club at that point. Yeah. Uh, so o o older shot. Um, so what, what's your take on that in terms of going out on loan, but not to a league club? Oh, I, I loved it. The loan experience was great for me, I think. It's what I needed, not just as a player, but as a person as well. It was the first time I'd been away from home. It wasn't as if I was an hour around the corner from home. I was four hours away. But I think that loan experience was great, getting the men's football. Obviously, we didn't do great at the time at Older Shot, and we had a group that should have done so much better than what we did. But for me as a person, I think that experience was massive. Like, like I said, living away from home, my family came down to watch me every weekend, even though it was a four-hour drive. So... I still saw them a lot, but I met people there that I've been in contact with ever since. And I probably class some people I met there as my best mates now, but that's just all part of football. But like, I went there and played 40 odd games and I loved it. Like just playing football, fans there, three points on the line every weekend. And it meant a lot. And I, I loved the experience there. So um, so you did the one season at Older Shot. So, so, so what happened from then on so Notts County coming in for you? So in the January of the year, I was on loan at Aldershot on deadline day. Barnett tried signing me permanently. Um, so I was like in contact with Huddersfield because I had an option year in my contract at Huddersfield. So, and at this point, they were pretty much relegated from the Premier League. So I was thinking I could go back there after a year on loan and have a good pre-season and see what happens. So I spoke to them in January and they were they told me, they were like, yeah, we'll give you your option year. So at this point, I was like to my agent, I don't want to go to Barnet full time if I've potentially got another year of Huddersfield to prove myself. So that, that all calmed down. It got to about the April time and had a phone call from Huddersfield to tell me that I wasn't going to have my option year, that my deal was going to be up in the summer and I was going to get let go of. So that was a tough one to take knowing I could have secured myself for like 18 months to get into the summer knowing that I'd had nothing on the table at the time. So got to that summer, I went training with various clubs. I was at Bradford for three weeks, thought that I was going to sign there, got told that I wasn't going to be signing there. And then I was just training with Halifax, trying to keep fit. And 
out of nowhere, four games, three games into the season. I think Doyle had got suspended first game and then Jim had got uh, injured against Barnet. I woke up on Sunday morning to a phone call from the manager and basically just asked my situation, asked how I'd been doing training, if I was fit, if I played games. And this was about 10 o'clock and by two o'clock that afternoon, everything was sorted. Come down on the Monday, have your medical and then start on Tuesday night at Harrogate because obviously the injuries and suspension. So. so quite literally, the way Notts County, you were introduced to the club, was the manager, Neil, ringing you up on a Sunday morning, yeah? Yeah, he rang me Sunday morning, obviously, because the game, I think it was a late kickoff on the Saturday against Barn, it was on TV. So literally Sunday morning call and then I drove down Monday morning met all the lads, still hadn't met a couple of lads when we went out to training and we're doing shape for the game the next day and I'm introducing myself to lads on the training pitch that have been getting treatment or doing stretching or stuff when I've got there. And so what would this have literally led to being in the team for Harrogate a few days later? Yes, yeah, so my first training session was, the, so I drove down on the Monday, first training session was on the Monday and then on the Tuesday night we played Harrogate which I started the game and classic sort of 24 48 hours ups and downs of a professional football and you never quite know which way it was going to go so you're straight in remember the game uh straight into uh, into midfield um you, you suddenly see an awful lot of Notts County fans albeit away from home yeah um so that must have been a um a pretty nice debut for us and I seem to remember you did very well uh and it was a very it was a quality performance and, and we were good value for the three points yeah, obviously that was my first, obviously getting there, seeing the whole 800, 900 away fans was like quite a, obviously a good feeling knowing that we're getting backed by that many fans away from home. And obviously it was a great performance, like you said, I think they missed a penalty early doors, but we missed some good chances. And then obviously Deno scored the penalty early door left, they had the man sent off, which obviously a nice relief, but they had a real go at the second half and I think we, we got a late goal at the end of the second half from Enzio's header. So that was a, a great start to my time there. Obviously, away game, 2 nil win, you can't really ask for much more, to be honest. So you had a season at Oldershot. Um, so you've now come to Knotts and although it's National League, clearly the setup at Knotts is very much uh, still Football League, the stadium, fan base. So, so how did you settle in? Yeah, I settled in really well, actually, because it was quite a busy schedule at the time. So, obviously, we had that game Tuesday night. Uh, in the meantime, I was, like, staying at families in Leicester because to save me travelling up from what is still every day. So, it was only, like, half an hour there. And I settled in really well. And then, obviously, the second game, we had Wrexham on the Sunday, which I think there was, like, 7,500 there. Wrexham bought, like, 1,500, 2,000. So, and that was, obviously, my first experience in Meadow Lane. And I, it was a bit of, like, a shock to... What it was like, so obviously I went from Aldershot, don't get me wrong, the fans are great, but we'd have like 2,000 to play in at uh, 20,000 seat stadium, with seven, 8,000 there. And we, to be fair, after that, we had like a team bonding meal night out. So obviously it was such a new group at the time, which I think helped us all bond together as a group. And obviously it took a while for that because new players were coming in and stuff like that along the way. Um, so what were, what were the group of players like? Great group. I couldn't really say there was one person in the group that I didn't get on with. I think it was a really good group and it's shown that the togetherness through the season with everything that went on and how it all started. We got so close to achieving something special as a group. And I think we were all good not to achieve that because of how far we'd come from having, like, I know at the start of pre-season we had about 10 players signed on to probably having a complete new squad by the end of the season. But I still speak to probably seven or eight of the lads now from that I was there. So it just shows how good of a group that we had there. I mean, obviously, one of the, the, the players that you were battling either to play alongside or very hard to displace uh, is Michael Doyle. Uh, and age does not seem to make any difference to him. I mean, what, what was he like in training? What's he like to play alongside? He's just an out and out winner, wants the best from you, wants the best from everyone. He'll have a go at you, but you know that's because he wants the best for you and I think his experience and how well he's doing and still now to be playing at the standards he is and setting the standards he is for other lads. I've got, I've got nothing but respect for him. He's 38, 39 now and he's still one of the furthest runners on the pitch, plays every game. I think he's a fantastic professional and he, he helped me a lot in the time that I was there and 
even since I've left, I've, he still contacted me to see how things are going. So I've got nothing but respect for him. So d- d- did he kick you in training or not? Uh, once or twice, yeah. But everyone gets one or two of them in training, so it's expected. I mean, is it what we all know? Training theoretically not meant to be no contact. You don't want to be getting injured, but you know. Uh, Michael strikes me as someone who's incredibly competitive and will want to win anything, be it six aside or whatever, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably what's made him achieve so much in the game and that's why he's still playing now because he wants to win. He's got that desire to win, whether it be training, games. And I think you can't fault him for having that. That's just the way he is. And like I said, that's that's why he's got so far in the game and done so well. Now, so you've come from... Uh, Saturday on a Sunday morning to playing for Knox at Harrogate within 72 hours and you were kind of then very much involved in the team all the way through you clocked up 23 appearances a lot of those basically came in that sort of three month period leading up to Christmas I mean another game uh, that sticks in the memory uh, was the 4-0 win at Woking uh, which was I would have said certainly one of the top three performances of the season and I seem to remember there were one or two worldly goals that night. Enzio put one in, didn't he? Um, but that was because Woking were doing very well at the time. Um, friend of mine is Martin Tyler. The, oh, uh, really? Yeah, I've known Martin for 20 years. Uh, and it's quite surreal uh, to see Martin Tyler, the Sky commentator, sat in the, in the dugout, assistant manager. I was yeah. just in before the game, but we got stuck in traffic on, on the train set, so we didn't get a chance to chat with him. But that yeah. was a great performance that night. Do you remember much of that? Yeah, I remember us going there knowing that it was going to be a tough game as they'd started the season really well. But one of the big things we had to make sure we did that game was start the game well. And probably the first half an hour of that game was the best we played all season. I think we were two, I think we were two nil up in the first 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It could have been five or six. Literally, they couldn't get the ball off us. And I think they had probably one shot from about 30 yards. But we probably could have been four or five up at that point. Obviously, we went on to win the game four nil. I think that was a time where we really started to show what we could do as a group, as a team. So obviously, I think that was, was it late, mid to late October time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that was probably us a bit stamping a bit of authority, showing that this is what we can do as a team and this is the standards that we can achieve as a group. But like, hope, I think it kicked us on a bit at the time. We had a bit of a good run and then obviously life at the run probably came to an end. But I think... That game was probably one that stands out for me. A night game, going there again, a, f- a big following. So didn't it was a Tuesday night away at Woking, three hours away, and nothing like like you said. It's probably one of the best performances of the season. Um, your first goal, senior football, then was uh, Ebbs a few weeks earlier. Ebbs Fleet away. Remember that one? Yeah, it was probably one of the hottest days of the year. It was um, the bank holiday. It was my third game, so we had Wrexham. No. no Harrogate first game, Wrexham second game, and then this was on the Saturday. We played away at Ebbs Fleet. It was about 35 degrees, and I think my goal put us 2-1 up, and then the own goal was Jim, where no one really knew what happened. Obviously, yeah. it was a mad hot day, and then obviously on the Monday, we I think it was even hotter. We played Chorley at home on 5-1 or whatever. But yeah. yeah, my first goal in senior football, it took me about 40 or uh, I think about 45 games to achieve it, but got there in the end. Yeah. Um... So clearly those first two or three months, life is great, isn't it? Because you're playing regular football, yeah? Big club, jobs are good. Em. But then, of course, the, the, the injury starts to come in and kind of disrupt things for you. Yeah, I think that first three months at the club was probably the most I've enjoyed football. I was loving it. Obviously, we were starting to pick results up. I was getting assists, scoring a couple of goals and... I'd been carrying the injury since about the Woking game time and I'd been kind of just trying to manage it and then it got to the stage of my last game was the Chesterfield one, the FA Trophy game and it got to that and after that I'd I'd been seeing like a specialist up at home to try and help with it all like a bit of physio and stuff like that and it was starting to get better and then just one week it just I was struggling to bend down get out of bed and I just obviously spoke to the physio and the gap and just said, I need to, I need to get this sorted. So, so this, this was in, uh, in your lower back? Yeah, it was a disc problem in my lower back. So obviously I went for a scan just before Christmas, come back that it was like a disc extrusion or disc protrusion in my back. So like it was coming out to the side, onto, right onto my nerve. 
So I was constantly getting shooting pains all down like my leg into my nerve. So it wasn't nice, but so at the time I had, um, obviously was out for a couple of months. I think I came back at around the end of February because I had an injection in my back around the middle of February, came back at the end and felt fine at the time coming back and I was ready to be involved. And then obviously lockdown happened, which obviously came at a bad time, but also in hindsight, I probably wasn't fully recovered. Like I would probably rush to get back, to get back playing because of how well I felt like I'd done beforehand. I just wanted to get back playing football. So. How frustrating then, ask any professional footballer, what's the worst time of their career? They'll always say when they're injured. Yeah. So you've kind of like burst onto the scene, getting regular football and then to be set back by this injury must be a difficult time for you. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't easy at all. Obviously, I did it the first time and what obviously I'll speak to you later about the second time that it happened. But yeah, it was frustrating because I felt like I was doing so well. Even when I was carrying the injury, I probably wasn't playing at 100% but still doing well. So like to be able to like to have to stop, it was a killer at the time. Because like I said, I was really enjoying my football and I really thought like I was starting to show people what I was about and stuff like that. So it was it was a nightmare time really that and it just it just came at a really bad time for me. So take us kind of into the dressing room, yeah? So who were the characters, you know? I mean, I don't know who you room with when you would travel away. I mean, what, what's the gaffer like? What, what was it like inside that dressing room bubble? Who's the jokers? Who's the serious ones? Who's the winners? You know, that, that sort of thing. Probably say characters, probably Jim O'Brien's one of the big characters. Or you've got something to say, no matter what. You, you, you can't, you've just got to take him the right, like, he's a great guy and, like, He'll just be on at you about every little thing, but he's just doing it for laughs and stuff. So you don't mind it at all. Um, I roomed with Connell at away trips, who's another very good character. Like we got on really well. Like we'd like from the first time, like first day at the club, Harrogate away, I was sat with him at pre-match, just talking to him because he knew someone that I knew. So I kind of had a bit of a common common person that we knew. And from then on, I roomed with him and. I used to have Deno stay at mine because I moved down to Knotts at the time. Den Deno used to stay down every Thursday night to save him travelling. So he'd cook for me every Thursday night. Um, Tom Crawford used to stay sometimes. We'd, we'd always have a little coffee club with like Pierce Bird, Chris not say Chamberlain, Toots, Matt Toot, or Ross, um, Connell. We'd have a few of us that used to go and get coffee a lot of days after training. So... It was a really good Where was group. the coffee stop then? Where was the coffee stop? Uh, we used to go to Zinc in West Bridgeford. Where, sorry? Zinc. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just sitting there for probably three hours a day, just sit there, drink, have a little coffee. Just, it, it was good. It was really good. Like, it was, it was a great group to be a part of. And like I said, from that group that I was there with, I still speak to probably eight, seven or eight of the lads now. So it shows how good a group it was. I'm still in contact with a lot of them. Um. What what was the gaffer like? Um, it was it was great for me to be fair. Obviously, he brought me to the club and stuff, and um, he, you knew you knew. Obviously, he he was quite reserved at times. Like he, you didn't sometimes know where you stood. If that makes sense, like with managers, sometimes they're either like you know exactly where you stand, or sometimes you don't. I feel the gaffer sometimes you didn't. Not not saying that's a bad thing, but it like be quite reserved at times and then sometimes he'd be laughing and joking on the training pitch. So you never you never knew what you was going to get from him really. But obviously, like I said, I've got nothing, no bad words to say about manager at all. He brought me to the club. Obviously it was great with me when I had my injury and even like the second time was great with it. So um and I think I've seen on Twitter um uh, you mentioned Christian Dennis. Um so uh, I don't know whether it was your nickname or the group nickname. You, you call him what? Fossil. Yeah. Because because he, well, because I used, to, basically, I used to live with one of my mates from home, and obviously we were both my age at the time, we were like 21, 22, and it was his 30th birthday, so I used to call him the fossil, because uh, he was a lot older than me and my housemate, and then it kind of stuck with me and my housemate that we just used to call him that all the time. Ah, uh, very good, very good. So where, where about in Nottingham, were you? Where was your place in Nottingham? Uh, Mapley. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I used to live in an apartment uh, in Mackley with my well, one of my best mates from home. So, which obviously he still lives down in Knox. He was working down there after uni. Yeah, 
uh, I don't exactly know where, but Mapley many moons ago used to be um, kind of a very, well, still is, uh, but used to be a place where a lot of the um, professional sportsmen in Nottingham used to live. You're too young to remember a lot of these people, but um, Tony Hately, who, who, who started at Nottingham but went on to play for Liverpool, all the rest of it, he used to live on Mapley Top. Uh, yeah, that's the where I used to live, just, yeah. just past all the, um, the shops and like the bars and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, you'd have to speak to someone a lot older, but probably the world's greatest cricketer at the time was um, Garfield Sobers, Gary Sobers. Uh, he played for Nottinghamshire, West yeah. Indian captain, and he used to live on Mapley Top as well. So there's quite a lot of um, sports connections with Mapley. Uh, short trip down for training, isn't it? So, yeah, um, not bad. Ten minutes every day, so it was all right. Yeah. L l l life's a good one. Um, you've already kind of alluded to this a little bit. But then you had a second issue with your back, yeah? Yeah, this came literally in June, just before. So obviously, like I said, I came back fit in the February. Yeah. Um, at the end, of ready to be back involved. Obviously, lockdown happened. So I thought, I'm going to use this time to get fit and ready to go in case anything does happen and get back up to the levels that I was at before. So everything was going fine. For I was at the stage where I felt really fit, probably the fittest I've ever felt in my whole career. Because I was doing that much, I was probably doing four or five running sessions a week to get, because obviously we were in lockdown at the time, it was like a nice relief as well to get out, go running and do like interval sessions, this and that. And it was three days, before, so we were due to go back in on the Monday for back to training for the playoffs. And I think it was about three days before I was doing a session, just gone to set off on a sprint and like the whole right side just kind of like seized up and I was like, I just stopped the session. I was like, wow, what was that? At the time, I just thought it was a muscle spasm. So I obviously spoke to the physio and just explained the situation. He was like, come in on Monday, get a bit of treatment and we'll go from there. But over that weekend, I was in agony. So I ended up going to A&E to get tablets for like painkillers. So yeah, so so literally you had to go to the hospital, yeah, over the weekend. Yeah, because at the time I couldn't, we couldn't sort anything private out quick because of lockdown. All like private hospitals were um, like COVID wards and stuff. So I went to A and E, was got tablets and stuff, and over the weekend it kind of got better a little bit. So I thought, oh, this isn't too bad. Went in on the Monday. We were sure that it wasn't anything that serious, so I was like, hopefully, just see how it settles down. But then on the Tuesday. Tuesday light like, evening, I was in agony. I couldn't stand up. Like I was only comfortable laying down. I couldn't sleep. I had like two hours sleep. So I was like to the physio, I was like, I'm gonna have to go to A&E again. I ended up being on like eight codeine tablets a day for about a week and a half because literally that's all that could like numb the pain for me to literally just get through because I couldn't eat or anything. Couldn't stand up to go and cook food. So it was a nightmare at the time obviously got scammed and basically what I'd done before had happened worse. The disc had come out more. So they said to me, they were like, you can either have an operation, which will be six months until like the scar tissue's gone. You can have an injection and have a proper rehab, which will be like minimum four months till you're back. Or you can just leave it and settle it itself. So to be told that, to know that no matter which option I took, it was going to be at least four months was probably one of the hardest things to be told at the time, knowing that the playoffs was around the corner and how good I felt a week before to them feeling like this. But I ended up getting an injection and seeing a spinal specialist and fingers crossed now everything's been fine for the last three, four months, obviously been back home and stuff, so all good now, hopefully. I mean, what, what you're talking about here gives kind of a bit of a realistic insight into a, a professional footballer. Um, and if you get a, a, a chronic injury, which I guess that would be deemed as chronic, a, a chronic yeah. back issue, you would have been on a one-year contract at not. So that, so I'm guessing instantly you think to yourself, well, this is now going to be a challenge because I can't even start. I wouldn't even be able to do pre-season. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, I kind of just thought my priority's got to be my health. Now I, I can't worry about contract situation after what had happened before and then for it to happen worse I was like I just need to get this sorted no matter how long it takes no matter what I have to do I need to get this sorted and then go from there really but that knots were great I mean I did all my rehab there and everything from the stuff I had from the spinal specialist and I was allowed to be back training there when until something else came up so they were great with me even though obviously I wasn't going to stay another year there 
what, what happens, because it varies from club to club and manager to manager, so did you go down to Wembley or did you not? Or where were you? Obviously, you knew you couldn't train, you couldn't be involved in the squad. Where were you when all this was happening? So, majority of the time, I was obviously in, at my apartment in Knox because obviously there was no point me going in because I couldn't really get any treatment because it was just a matter of time having the injection, d- doing like basic rehab stuff for like hours a day. But then I'd started going into the um, the ground because I think Damo was injured as well at the time. So, I was in with him doing rehab stuff. And obviously, I was at the playoff semi against Barnet at home yeah. and then we all travelled to Wembley as a squad even all the injured players everyone that wasn't involved so we you travelled down to Wembley yeah yeah we all travelled to Wembley yeah, on the day yeah um, right. of the squad clearly don't want to remind you of that because what, what wasn't the greatest day unfortunately for us but I mean bad enough playing out there presumably even worse sat in the stands knowing that you can't contribute yeah, there's nothing worse watching a game of football and knowing that you can have no impact whatsoever on what's happening. Whereas when you're in the game, you know you can impact it. But watching, you basically... I feel I feel more nervous watching games than playing in games because, like I said, you can't have an impact on what's going on. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great. Obviously, it had been an unbelievable end to a very good season, going from where we started to where it would have ended. But... Obviously, it just wasn't meant to be on the day. Harrogate, you have to hold your hands up. They were a better team and deserve to win the game. I suppose it's all the more ironic. Your first game was against Harrogate, middle of the part, and you win and, and, and you win relatively comfortably. Yeah, they, they to be fair, it was us and them obviously chasing Barrow come the end of the season. I think if the season went on, Barrow would have been caught because it was getting to the stage. Obviously, we'd beat them away. We had the strikers suspended. They started to drop a few points here and there. I think Harrogate were four points behind and we were like seven points behind. So, but obviously, it was the two of the best teams involved in the final, which was the right way for it to be decided to go up. And like I said, unfortunately, they, they beat us on the day and got promoted. So, so clearly it wasn't a great journey home. Um, from your own personal perspective, you mentioned earlier, you are now focusing on your health rather than anything else. Did you effectively know then that your contract wouldn't be renewed and, and that the decision for it not to be renewed was no real surprise from your perspective? Yeah, I was 99% sure at the time. Obviously, you're never completely sure what's going to happen, but I was pretty sure that because I knew the length of time that I was going to be out for as well, but I knew that my contract wasn't going to be renewed. So I was kind of prepared for that in a sense. But obviously, when you get told the news, obviously still not nice. But like when I had my meeting, they said to me, we're going to be here for you now more than ever. Like you can use everything here. We, if you ever need to put your name out to managers, we'll do that. When you're back fit, you will do that for you. When you're back fit, you can train here until you've got somewhere else to go. So that it, it was the best out of a bad situation, really, because I, was, I stayed there until about the end of November, start of December time, until I was fit and ready to go somewhere else. So... How physically is the is the news broken to you in, in in this scenario? It's literally just plain and simple. You go into you go into a meeting with the gaffer and Coxie at the time, and you're basically told whether you're getting offered a new deal or you're not. It's as simple as that, really. It's just there's no beating around the bush in a sense, and then you just have a chat, and that's it, really. Yeah, I mean, we, we've spoke to the reason for asking is we spoke to other players from previous generations at the club. Uh, Greg Tempest and Fabian Spice, uh, and I think by their own admission, they found it very difficult to cope with that. And it, it might have been a bit more of a surprise to them or challenge to them th- than yourself. But nevertheless, for a young man at that age, it's presumably a tough one to bear, yeah? Yeah, it had gone from a real high in the first few months of the season to obviously the lows with the injuries and then knowing that once I'm back from injury, I've got to go and prove myself to people again and, and get my career back on track in a sense. But like I said, I was kind of prepared for it anyway because of the situation I was in. So it didn't hit, obviously it hit me hard because I was leaving a very good group in a massive football club, but I was kind of prepared for that in a sense. So it wasn't too bad. So, so then you have focused on getting uh, your health back and your ability to play professional football again, yeah? And what was that road like? It's probably the most mentally and physically draining, like, tough thing I've had to do, mentally more than anything, because for, like, the rehab was so, like, boring to a certain extent, but it was what I had to do. But I was doing, like, the same thing for 
an hour and a half, two hours a day, just in a um, gym on my own. Like, so obviously everyone else was out training and stuff or everyone was off their summer break. I was in just in a gym on my own doing the rehab work. And then obviously going through the whole like building fitness back up, like bike sessions, running sessions, weight sessions. It, it, it wasn't easy, but I feel like in hindsight, it could be, I could look back at this in a couple of years time and think that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it was a realization of what I need to do with my body and how I need to look after myself like before and after games slash training or whatever with the exercise and strengthening stuff that I do. And like I said, now I'm feeling as good as I probably have done in two years. Cause like I said, I was carrying it for a bit of time at knots, but now I don't go into games or training worrying about how my back's feeling. Okay. So um, you are, on, or, or were, obviously COVID's come along, hasn't helped you. Um, so talk us how you ended up then. So Bradford Park Avenue uh, came along. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously I did all my rehab and, stuff at Knott's and was back training and Greg Abbott, the assistant at Knott's, um, was good friends with the manager and assistant at Bradford Park Avenue and he just said to me, he was like, do you want to go get some games under your belt? And I was like, yeah, 100%. I was like, I can go live at home. It was only part-time, like training Tuesday, Thursday, and then I'd do my own stuff on like a Monday and a Friday. But I was just, I obviously spoke to Bradford and was like, yeah, I want to get back playing. So I think my first game there was I think it was a year to the day, maybe, or literally years to the day since I played my last game against Chesterfield. So obviously that I played 45 minutes my first game and then 75 on the Tuesday. Then I think I played like four or five nineties in the games that we had. And then obviously the league stopped, but it was just good to have, to be on a Saturday and have a game to look forward to and, having something to aim towards every week. Whereas obviously when I first came back training, you're just training with no games to look forward to. And it's just getting the, like the training in your legs. So, And of course, um, you would have come across a certain Lewis Knight, who a, a lot of Knotts fans are, are, are quite interested now we've signed him. Tell us a bit about Lewis. What do you know about him? Um, first and foremost, he's a great lad. I got on really well with him when I went to Bradford Park Avenue. He did really well for us. I think he scored a lot of goals in a team that weren't at the right end of the table, obviously towards the middle to the bottom end of the table, but he scored, I think, 12 or 13 goals. He was ridiculously quick for a start and he was playing on his own up front for us, but did really well. So I think it could benefit massively if I'm playing off someone like Kyle, obviously, who's done really well up front, like someone like that, because he tends to drift wide and stuff obviously he wants to get involved in the game but when you're only playing with one up top that's hard to do that but I think he'll really benefit from being in full-time football and playing off someone like Kyle and with the quality players in behind I think he'll do really well for you. What's he like as a character? Yeah he's a good lad he's just typical northern lad just loves talking and just he's just a normal normal lad really I've gotten really well with him so. There would be parallels because he would have come through a, a an academy system which leads like you were, were, were with at Huddersfield then things haven't quite worked out for him there Lee Curtis the um, Nottingham Post football correspondent that covers Notts did a very good uh, sort of welcome interview when he arrived when he was um, uh, a barista I think that's the posh word for it making yeah. the coffees um, a, a, a service station on the M62 when he wasn't playing for Bradford Park Avenue yeah, he, um, he works at Starbucks at uh, Hearts Edmore Services. So every time he turned up to training, he used to go past Starbucks and turn over coffee from there every day because he'd get it for free or whatever. But I think I think he'd been on furlough for a while. So while I was there, I don't think he'd been working there. So, but I, like, obviously, I spoke to him when he signed, and I was like, "You have to end your notes in there now. There's no no more making coffees at Starbucks anymore." But presumably, he must have been delighted to get back into inverted commas the full time football ranks again. Yeah. Yeah, definitely he was delighted, obviously. Great, like, similar to obviously when I went to Bradford Park, I mean, Greg uh, rang me and asked about what I thought about him. And I was like, I think he'll be perfect for the club. I think the way he plays, and he's got a great attitude. And I think he'll flourish, like I said, playing off someone. But when when I um, when he signed, I texted him saying, you're welcome, you owe me one. And he was like, oh, well, I'll sort something, don't worry. But yeah, he's, I think he's buzzing to be, to be there. And obviously he'll realise when the fans are back in, how much of a, big club it is and how much the fans can get behind you when you're doing well. How quick is he? Very quick. Yeah? Yeah. You won't, you won't think it looking at him, but he's very quick. 
Yeah. And he's very hard working as well. So you'll think he's not going to get there and he'll get there and he'll chase things down and do the horrible side of things that not many people like doing, which is always good as a forward because you were in your luck and working hard. I'm sure he'll get a lot of luck, score a lot of goals. Yeah. I, I, we always love to put pressure on people. He's not, he's not a poor man's Jamie Vardy, is he? No, no. You can't compare anyone to Vardy these days. <laughs> But no, hopefully he does really well. Um, I still speak to him every now and again, so I'm 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 rooting for him as well. There. So so in terms of your own situation, so you were at Bradford, and then of course COVID's come along. So so where are you with everything now? Uh, so when the season stopped at Bradford, obviously there was a number of teams that wanted to carry on, yeah. like with like a combined league. So at this point, I went to Chorley. You'll probably you'll know of Chorley because obviously they were in the National League last year and the manager had been in contact with me ever since like, I'd left Knox. So I ended up going over there. So we're still training and playing friendlies there until the end of April, like a normal season would run. Like, so there's a normal schedule there. So we're training like two, three nights a week, having friendlies on like a Wednesday or a Saturday. And it's good to just keep busy, obviously, with the times that it is at the minute. It's nice to keep ticking over and doing stuff and have things to look forward to. Because Chorley kind of shot to prominence most recently with their FA Cup run, didn't they? Yeah, they had a ridiculous FA Cup run. Obviously, they got to, I think, the fifth round or something and lost 1-0 to Wolves when they probably should have beat them. So, there's a lot of, you know, obviously, all the lads there from the Cup run and they've done really well. And obviously, they've got it not to be able to get the chance to um, carry on with the season. Like, I think there were 17 or 18 clubs that wanted to combine the leagues to obviously have the chance of promotion. But, it didn't end up going ahead. So. so so are you effectively now a Chorley player or is it kind of given furlough and it's such a strange world? You're kind yeah. of training with Chorley with a view to let's see what happens when things come back. Because clearly the earliest for you guys is going to be Pre-season. August, September or whenever the National League gets its act together for the start of next season, yeah? Yeah, well, I, I signed a non-contract there just in case of the season carrying on so I would have been able to play. But obviously, there will be decisions made on everyone between now and the end of April for next season. So I'll just have to see what happens, really, and go from there. Yeah. I mean, a lot has clearly happened. And, and we hear a lot about players that come through um, that youth system. Uh, and sometimes it can knock them a little bit. And, and, and I think it's quite a high percentage of people that then almost stop playing any form of reasonable competitive football. It sounds like you still have, which is probably the most important thing of all, you still have the enthusiasm for the game to play at the highest level you can. Yeah, 100%. I feel like the where I was at Knox was probably, like I said, the best time of my career and I want to get back to that. And I think the way things are going now, like the, like the way I feel myself now, I'm starting to feel fitter and everything now. And I, I just want to be able to get back playing full-time football as soon as possible, really. Because I think I've had to deal with a lot in the last probably year, 18 months, but to come out the other side and still have that desire to want to play and to do all the stuff that obviously I've had to do to get to where I am now. I think I just, like I said, I just want to get back playing and back playing full-time, especially. How is the back now? Yeah, it's all good now. I feel it's the best it's... I have exercises to do and stuff before training and games and I'll have to do that probably for the rest of my career now, but I know it's helped me and it's, it's got me feeling like like I'm, I'm going to games, not worrying about it anymore, whereas times I was going to games, taking painkillers before games, worrying how my back was going to cope, but yeah, all good now, thankfully, so touch wood that it's, um, it stays that way. It's been a real uh, topsy-turvy season for all sorts of reasons um, and, it, and in the and in the main national league, uh, you know, Torquay looked to shoe in for a lot for a lot of people's perspective. They've not kind of lost ground. Sutton now would appear to be very much in the dominant position. Um, what, what's your take on it all? Are you still keeping an eye on knots and and, and, and I guess old shot because did did you do go down to old shot for the game that went when knots played him this year? Were you on the te- on their stream, the commentary? Yeah, I got asked to because they have like a pre-game show and stuff like yeah. that. Because I play for both teams, they asked me if I'd come down and do it. And good. Well, yeah, it's a good chance, obviously, go and watch a game and see what it was like. But but yeah, I keep I keep tabs on both teams. I've got I've got mates that are still at all the shop that are still playing there. And obviously, like I said, there's I'm still getting well with a lot of lads that are at knots and hopefully 
they can achieve this year that we that we set out to achieve last year in promotion. I think the way things are going, they've got a good chance of doing that. So, yeah, I, I mean, um, it, it is so difficult for everyone with um, with, with COVID. I guess I mean, it's good that you've got chore, isn't it? Because you're still getting regular training under your belt and you're not just having to sit there and wait for things to happen. Yeah, it's good mentally as well. Like I said, I've got something to look forward to and I have a routine knowing I'm going training on Tuesday, training on Thursday and stuff like that instead of being sat in doing nothing because I've never had the stage where I've not got a routine, get up, go to training every day. And it's been hard to get used to, but obviously... Like I said, I want to get back to that full time. So I wouldn't want to jump into something now in case in six months time, full time offer comes back again. So I'm just staying as fit as I can and seeing what comes up, obviously, if, see what happens with Charlie and if not, see what happens next year. So, Well, well hopefully, if, if, if you're not playing, um, I'm sure everyone would love to see you back at Madeleine watch it, watch, watching your pal uh, in the start in 11. Yeah, definitely. I'll... I'll probably, when fans are allowed, I'll definitely be making an appearance back down to, because like I said, I'm still really good mates with the majority of the lads there. Like I speak to Cal pretty much every day. Um, obviously like Lewis is staying there now. I still speak to like Turns, Damo, Dion, like Ruben from the time that I was there. I still speak to a lot of the lads there. So I'll 100% be coming back to watch when fans are finally allowed back in. And hopefully it could be. If it's not automatic promotion, hopefully fans are allowed to play a final. And I'd like to make an appearance there again to watch the lads. Absolutely. We'd all love to see you. You just mentioned Kel Roberts there briefly. Of course, Kel, um, like Lewis, like yourself, has kind of gone through that academy system, been released by the parent club that they've been at for many years and then ha have to come again. Um, it's ob obviously, I guess, not dissimilar to you. It must have, it's been a very frustrating time for Cal the past four or five months with having had the COVID and then having had a succession of injuries and can't get back into the swing of it. Um, have you been able to sort of just like, you know, reassure him a little bit and say, look, you'll get there. I know it's frustrating. I've been through it myself. Yeah, like I said, I speak to him most days, to be fair, and he's, he's frustrated. It's like any player, when you're injured, you just want to be back playing. And when so, so, something there that just constantly is keep getting on at you. But like I said, yeah, I, I speak to him a lot. So I, we try not to talk about football too much, to be fair, because there's, there's more to life than football, obviously, especially when you're injured. The last thing you want to be talking about is football all the time. But yeah, I, I always speak to him and I, I think he's getting back to a good place now, which is good. Yeah. How do you relax away from football then? Um, I've been doing a lot of walking recently, actually. Yeah? I took, I took it for granted. I've never really enjoyed walking, but it really made me appreciate it when I recovered from my injury, when I could go on walks again, because I was at the stage where I couldn't even go on walks at one point. But obviously because of the lockdown and stuff and then um, the walking, I've been walking up to go and see my sister outside because she's... Uh, having a kid very soon, ready to pop shortly. So been going up to see her every now and again and just trying to get out there. When my mum comes home from work, I'll go for a walk with her or it's just, especially now the weather's picking up as well. And it's just nice to get out there and not be sat inside in the house all day doing nothing. So. Yeah. I, well, fresh air as well makes a big difference, doesn't it? You exactly. know, particularly with what we've had to been through over the, the last year. Yes. The exercise, but it's also just the fresh air and it, can change, you know, blow the cobwebs out, so we would say in old style language. Yeah, definitely. It's just good nice to get get out there. And like I said, if I pop up and see my sister, see how she is, and then go for a walk with mum because she's been at work all day. She don't want to be sat inside all because she's been sat in an office. So it's just nice to get out there and just have a little wander about and keep keep the legs recovered from training and stuff as well. Now, I, there was some a little bit of gossip in the local media, I think, um, that we, not since signed Casper Slate at the start of this season. There was a possibility you might have been coming back. Was was there anything in that or not? Or No, I think people just put two and two together because I was still doing my rehab and yeah. was back training at the club at the time. So I was going to the games, watching the lads. And obviously, I think I was pictured in um, at one of the games or something. But even though I've been going to the majority of the games yeah. anyway, I was... Yeah. I was yeah. in the picture that gone to the game and like you never know what's going to happen in football but I don't think it was ever one of them because I wasn't at the time I wasn't fully ready to be back playing at the time and I think if I did re-sign at Knox it probably wouldn't have been the best thing for me at that time because 
Christy had such a strong squad at the time. I don't think I'd have got the games that I'd have needed, yeah. obviously, without playing for so long. I needed to go and get minutes in my legs. And I don't think if I was at Knox, that would have happened for me. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's good that, you know, clearly with what you've been through, you retain a positive outlook. You know, I think that's the most important thing. And also you have a genuine appetite and desire and enthusiasm to want to play because as we mentioned a little bit earlier you know there are there are stats out there that when players who go through an academy system um it's quite a high percentage of those that end up not playing football at any level by the time they're in their early 20s which is a great shame because all you've really done since the age of seven or eight is do your best to prepare to become a, a professional footballer yeah i think it's I think it's mentally more than anything. You've got to be mentally strong. It's a lot of stuff goes on in football that people don't see. Obviously, like the injuries and stuff you have to deal with behind the scenes and stuff like that. So more so mentally, I think you've got a strong mindset to just think of the best for yourself and get the best for yourself and look after yourself as good as possible. And hopefully, like you get the look you deserve if if you're treating yourself right, eating the right things, doing everything right. But like I said, there's some ridiculously good players that won't have made it in the game and that might be down to their mindset, it might be down to other things, but like I said, there's so much that goes on with footballers, you never know what it is that's hindered their process or hindered them from getting where they should have got to. It's been a delight to talk to you, uh, Regan, thank you very much. Thanks for the lowdown uh, on Lewis. Um, and, and, and thanks for sharing um, your story with us. I'm sure on behalf of all Notts County fans, you know, we wish you every success um, rebuilding your career. It's great you've got a positive mindset. Um, Chorley clearly uh, are a club that have, have, have done well uh, and, and hopefully things can, can, can work out for you there. Um, basically, thanks again uh, and hope you've enjoyed the chat. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. It's nice to sometimes shed a bit of a, a light on things that probably don't people don't really know about and obviously... You can only, people only suppose know what they're meant to know. And so it's nice to obviously keep my side of things from everything that's happened. So, and, and that's very much why I do these things. You know, you, you've been involved in professional football since you were seven or eight. You know, I've had many years in it. Um, but a lot of the people that watch and listen to these, we're kind of trying to take them into this bubble that is professional football. And is, you know, by definition, there's a lot of things you can't say while you're on the inside. You can probably only say 10%. Hopefully these shed a little bit of light into some of the challenges you face, um, how you cope and how you deal with those. So thank you um, very much indeed. I presume these shirts bring back a few memories, do they? Of, yeah, uh, good, good, good memories as well, especially, especially, to be fair, I scored in both of them, so it's not too bad. I scored one at home and one away, so... Yeah. Did you keep the shirts? Have you got them? Yeah, I've got them at home, yeah. I've kept... Um, I kept the one that I scored my first goal in away and at home because we got given them. I asked for them at the time because we had like two shirts. So I asked to keep them. So yeah. I've got them both upstairs somewhere. Never get rid of them. I won't. Never get rid of them. Always keep them. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to chat to us uh, and all the very, very best in the future. Thank you very much. Cheers.